Oh, okay. Um, good. Uh, good afternoon. Good. Uh, I was, uh, I was um, coming over here. I was actually eating lunch, and I met three gentlemen who said, as I got up, said, well, we'll be going over to your talk later on. And they looked a little nervous, and so I, I, I told them to begin drinking heavily because I thought that might help out. <laughs> um, thanks for that great introduction. I, I have, in fact, worked with um, wood ducks, Muscovy ducks, zebra finches, mallard ducks, and Atlantic bottlenose dolphins on auditory communication. And then I transitioned about 12 years ago into working on this kind of work with students and research in higher education and work to... Uh, uh, to try and use data to help, to help higher education institutions improve. And um, we'll see how, how the transition goes. I will say this, dolphins do not fill out surveys as well as students do, and so that's a, that's a big difference. Okay, so let's start here. You see I've got a title, Knowing the Path versus Walking the Path. I am incapable of doing original things. So who knows where that, where did I rip that off from? Wow. Anyone hear the movie called The Matrix? <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah. So there's a, there's a part when, uh, when, when Neo, the hero, is now suddenly realizing, and he's working, that, that his entire life prior to that moment has been lived in this artificial universe, and he's working with his mentor, Morpheus, who is trying to convince him that if he, because this, 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 this um, he's been living in this computer-generated universe, in fact, he can do all sorts of amazing things like dodge bullets and jump over buildings and things like that. If he just understands that he's not governed by the law of physics, and, and Neo keeps saying, yeah, I, I get that, but he actually can't do the things. And, and at one point, Morpheus says, well, there's a difference between knowing the path and walking the path. Okay? And, and this is a distinction I want to get at because it's come back to me over and over again as we've worked over the last seven or eight years at the Center of Inquiry and now the Higher Education Data Sharing Consortium with our colleagues and institutions to try and use assessment data, information about good practices and so on, that it's, it's one thing to know what the good practices are, what the high impact practices are, it's yet another thing to try and implement those effectively on our campus. Um, and so, you know, this, this difference between knowing about and knowing how is actually very old. Uh, if you go back to what people used to call practical wisdom versus wisdom, uh, there's something here from Gilbert Ryle, and that's, it's a nice quote where he distinguishes between knowing about and knowing how. And I'll just go through that because I want to touch on this and we'll come back to it again through the talk. Effective possession of a piece of knowledge, that involves knowing how to use that knowledge when required for the solution of other theoretical or practical problems. There's a distinction between the museum possession, okay, knowing about, and the workshop possession, knowing how. A silly person can be stocked with information yet never know how to answer particular questions. And so what I'm going to say here is, and I'm going to point out, and I think the re re research in the Wabash study would point to this, that in fact we have known for many, many years uh, about the practices and conditions that help our students develop. Uh, we do lots of additional research. I'll talk about some of the center's research. But what we find, uh, what we keep finding are things that we've sort of already known. And I'll, we'll talk about that a bit. The hard part's actually using it, doing something about it. So I'll be talking about the Wabash study today, and, uh, and I'm going to cover on three basic points. I'm going to talk about uh, our findings from the Wabash study on how students grow, um, our findings on the, the practices and conditions that help them grow, and then our work on using that knowledge for improvement. So let me, let me start by giving a, a brief overview of the Wabash study. Um, the Wabash study started in 2005 with a... With a um, uh, a test run of sorts, and then in 2006 began in earnest. And it's a study that we've been doing since that point. It's a longitudinal study, and so far to date, 49 institutions have joined the study. Okay? And these are institutions of all kinds. We have liberal arts colleges, some community colleges, publics, private universities. Uh, so it's, it's, it's institutions of all different kinds. 17,000 students uh, have, have joined in the study. Uh, we're still doing data collection, and we'll be testing the third cohort of students in their senior year or their fourth year uh, this spring. It's a longitudinal study, so that means we literally, uh, we measure a lot of stuff, and literally students, the day they walk on campus, will sit down and take a battery of questions about their high school experiences, uh, their background, and so on. We do all sorts of pre-testing at that point, and then we test them again at the end of the first year, doing a lot of the same questions about their attitudes and some outcome measures then, but also asking about their experiences in college, and then we do the same thing after the fourth year. So it's longitudinal. 
The purpose of this study, we never were trying to benchmark things. We never were trying to you know, sort of gauge how much college has an effect, in a sense. What we were interested in was uncovering what practices, conditions, things that people were doing on campuses that were making the most benefit or most impact on students. That was the goal on it, part one. Part two was then to parlay that information into helping the campuses that were participating actually use it uh, for improving things for their students. So in addition to doing all sorts of data collection analyses with the great people at the University of Iowa and Michigan and so on, we also literally do dozens and dozens of site visits to these institutions and others. We talk with students at the institutions. We have workshops for the institutions. And in some cases, we've been working with schools for five or six years on Wabash study and other data trying to use it for improvement. Okay, so that's background of the study. Okay, has anyone heard of this book? <laughs> Academically Adrift, a very, a very happy book. Um, so this came out about a year ago, and I want to use this as a framing for what, you know, the first question I said was, well, how much do we see students change and grow over the course of the Wabash study? And I want to frame that by referring back to this thing, because as you recall, when this book came out, uh, it was with a fair amount of, um, consternation about how little college was, was impacting students, with, especially with the measure of critical thinking. Uh, they're using something called the collegiate learning assessment, engaging change over four years. So how does what they found and talked about compare to what we have found in the Wabash study? And I wanna, you know, again, remind you, I'm not, we're not, never tried to use the Wabash study to do this kind of work. The thing I'll cover in the next couple of slides, but this is, I want to see a point of comparison. Okay. We use something in the Wabash, something called the, the, uh, the, the, the CAP critical thinking test. And this is our measure of growth over four years. On the far left, you'll see a little zero. That's the starting point. And we're using standard deviations that are a measure of change. And you'll see an upward slope here, okay? Students grew by about four, four standard deviations. And the point I wanna make here is that this is exactly the same level of change that people pointed to in the Academically Adrift book. Even though we use a different sample, different tests, different students obviously, we saw almost identical results when looking at changes in critical thinking over time that they did. Okay. Now before we go on, I wanna pause just for a minute and this whole idea of how we're measuring change here in terms of effect size, a, a little nerdy side here, I have real concerns about this. I'm not sure I would use this as a way of measuring the impact because it's, it's a statistical convention and it's a measure of change that's not based on research on how much outcomes should change over time. And we can come back to that later on. So this is our measure of change from, on critical thinking. How do the other variables, we measured 10 or 11 other things in the Wabash study, how does growth on those things compare to this growth on critical thinking, which is more or less identical to what you saw in Academically Adrift? So you see that blue line there, that's the same line. That's the rate of growth on the critical thinking. I'll go backwards here for a second and go forward, and it's a little depressing <laughs> because what you'll see is there's one line that goes higher than the blue line, that's our, our measure of moral reasoning, which did grow at a faster pace than critical thinking did. But most, every other one of the variables that we measured, and these measures are not perfect, grew at a slower pace than did the critical thinking changes that they saw in Academic Leadership and we saw in our own thing. And in fact, a good, one, two, three, the bottom four or so, let me see if my cursor will move here. There we go. These bottom, these actually ended up lower after four years of college than they started. And this one variable right here, you like this one? See how that goes way down? And this sort of follows, I think, the course of our economy from 2008 to now with a big drop. That's our measure of academic motivation. So that's a series of questions that students answered about how much they were interested in getting good grades, how much they were interested in working on, on um, learning for its own sake, and a variety of things about how interested they were in college. Okay. Let me continue. Here's another, here's another slide that depicts the sort of overall changes we saw. And, and again, from the back, what you'll see here is the blues. We've got each variable measured here. So we have our measure of moral reasoning at the top and critical thinking, socially responsible leadership. And again, I can go over these in detail of what they are if, you, if it would help out. But notice the ratio of the blue to the red. The blue stands for students, the proportion of students who grew at least modestly over four years. And the red stands for the proportion of students 
represents the proportion of students who stayed the same or declined. And what you'll see about halfway down uh, when you get to one of our measures of diversity is at that point we actually have more students staying the same or declining over four years than are growing. Okay? It's a little ugly. Now, as some people, have, actually many people have pointed out, you know, when we look at this thing, we can, one question you can ask is, well, to what extent do institutions differ? Are there systematic differences among institutions? So that college X, Wabash College maybe, has much greater growth than other colleges. And while we do see variations across institutions, by and large, as, as Jillian Kinsey and, and Alex McCormick could point out with Nessie and other people have, the variation within the institutions in these things is so much larger than the variation between. It's really enormous. So the differences among the best students and the, the students who grow the most and least within any given college is much, much larger than the differences between institutions. And here's just an example on two of the variables I was looking at. Um, if you take the students who, the top quartile of students, uh, uh, I, what I did is I took the, the, the top quartile of students and the bottom quartile of students and just say, well, how much does the top quartile represented in blue and the bottom quartile represented in red grow or decline on average? And so for one, one measure on the, something called the need for cognition, which is a measure of students' interest in difficult academic problems, the top quarter of students were growing phenomenally. I like 1.5, 1.4 standard deviations. That's huge. At the same time, the bottom quartile students were declining by about 0.6 standard deviations. Likewise, on critical thinking, the top quartile of students, they're growing a full standard deviation over four years, whereas the bottom quartile is declining by, by almost a standard deviation. So the range within our institutions is huge. Okay? So the, the reason we began this study was actually to mine this variation, mine this variability among students to say, okay, is there anything the institutions or what are the things the institution is doing that is somehow accounting for these differences? That sometimes, you know, are there programs or good practices these students are experiencing who are growing that accounts for their growth? And, or are there good practices and programs students are missing that accounts for their lack of growth or even decline? That's the goal of the study. So, with regard to that question, what did we find? And I have to say, this is something, this is, if, if you're into data analysis, this is a nerd's paradise. I have a file that has 1,700, no, 1,400 variables in it. 17,000 rows of data. It's amazing, okay? <laughs> it's a little, it actually takes a long time to work with. So, we, so the, the idea behind our analysis is always to say, well, let's look at any of these outcomes like critical thinking or moral reasoning. Can we find good practices and conditions that account for or help explain the growth or not growth of students across. What, what, so we did lots of analysis and what, what did we find? Okay, we found, <laughs> after a lot of money, frankly, we found what we already knew. So, so what do I mean by that? Well, what we found is this, what we already knew. If you go back to Chickering and Gamps in 1987, if you go back to Bob Pace before that, the good practices and conditions that we identified with lots of analyses that seem to promote student growth across outcomes are things we've known about for many, many years. And I'll go through those in a second. But there's something that about that knowledge, which I'll get to at the, toward the end of the talk, that makes even as, as plain or as common sense as that, those findings are to us, it turns out there's some qualities of that knowledge that actually make them pretty tough to implement successfully. And that's what I'll touch on toward the end. So what were the things we found? Um, okay, so we had this sort of, uh, you know, Wabash is a secular school, but we had this holy trinity, the big three findings of things that made a difference for our students, okay? And uh, this holy trinity actually contains elements of surveys that Nessie has and SERP uses and other things, so we're not talking about anything original here. Um, but the holy trinity works this way. One is a set of questions on good teaching and high quality interactions with faculty, and note here, and staff. One of the interesting things we found in our research was when we interviewed students, and we were asking them for examples of great faculty, faculty who really made a difference, they would start talking about someone, and then when we asked who they were, it turns out they were talking about a coach, or a librarian, or some other assistant. So the staff thing was really, it's interesting how students were, students' definition of faculty was much broader and ecumenical than frankly the faculty definition of faculty is. So what do we find there? So again, so students who report that their faculty are interested 
in teaching, that they perceive interest in their faculty in, part, uh, in teaching, that their faculty are interested in their development, um, that have great interaction with them outside of class. You know, they say their out-of-class interactions have an impact on their career development, their intellectual growth. Uh, students who report that their classes are clear and organized get prompt feedback. Students who report those things grow on our outcomes, okay, uh, given where they start. They also seem to influ influence grades and things like that. It makes perfect sense. Students who report being challenged at multiple levels, challenged in terms of writing a lot of papers, reading a lot of books, a lot of homework, but also being asked to do synthesis, analysis, hard intellectual work, challenged by other students in their class, challenged by their faculty. Students who experience those things or report experiencing those things tend to grow. Those who don't tend not to grow. And finally, on interactional diversity, we have a series of questions on um, you know, meaningful, how often have you had meaningful conversations with students about different issues or serious conversations with student affairs staff? Conversations with people who are different from you about matters of substance. And the more students report doing those things, the more they tend to grow. The less they report doing those things, the less they intend to grow, okay? These are all things we knew. We all knew good teaching, out-of-class interactions, challenge, those things made a difference. Now, here's where I'll start saying the first of our couple buts that makes these things a little hard to implement, or at least a little interesting to implement. Take the interactional diversity on meaningful conversations. What's been surprising to us both in our data on this, and this may not be surprising to you, and in our conversations with students has been the extent to which having meaningful conversations does not necessarily follow from having lots of structural diversity. <laughs> okay, what I mean by that is that over and over again we find that even places that are very diverse often don't have a surplus of meaningful conversations going on. Students will really point to that word, you said meaningful, you said serious, that merely creating situations in which there are diverse indivi individuals interacting with one another doesn't necessarily mean that serious, consequential conversations are taking place. Those are harder to create. Likewise with the good teaching measures, what's been really interesting in a lot of work, our work with good teaching is that I've always thought about stuff like prompt feedback, the structure of courses, uh, and so on in terms of their pedagogical import, right? That, that is that if I get stuff back to students in a timely manner, well, from good cognitive research, the sooner you get feedback back to students after they do assignment, the better it is, the more they can connect it with their activities. And while that's true, as we've learned in our conversations with students, a big component of the good teaching effect is probably due not just to the pedagogical content of the teaching practices, it's also due to the extent to which students view faculty pedagogy, staff disposition toward them as a sign of care. It's really potent. Uh, we first had a, had a feeling about this. We went to a larger institution and we were, we were interviewing students about, um, this is many years ago, about faculty who really, you know, the fa their best faculty, and they started to mention this one student, there was one faculty person who was teaching a, a, a um, general education course in geology. And the student said, oh my gosh, it's phenomenal, she just loves the class, she's great to interact with, you know, I've, you know, I, it's, I've really thought about my career, changed my career since I've talked with her or seen her, and we said, this is great, and, uh, and we know she loves teaching and she's really good, and, and so finally I said, well, well, how many times have you talked with her? And they said, oh, I've never talked with her individually. I said, well, what do you mean? How do you know all these things? Well, I come to class early and I watch her interact with the first front rows of the classroom. I see her interact with people on the quad. I've talked to other students who've gone to her office and she's very open and friendly. And as you start you know, sort of distilling lots of conversation with students about this, there's the pedagogy in class, there's the clear and organized classroom. That's important, but I think what these questions are also picking up is the extent to which the teachers care about the students, the extent to which they're committed to their development and growth, and that matters a lot, and that's part of what we're getting in some of this data. It's really interesting. So it means you don't just improve the quality of teaching by making your syllabus better. You also have to be visibly caring. How do you do a faculty workshop on that? Okay, so here are these big three. We're not finding anything new. Okay, I don't claim to be. This is reinforcing lots of stuff that's been researched before, both in small and large settings. We know all this stuff. So why is, is overall growth so bleh? 
Okay, we, here we have well-established good practices and so on. Why is it that when we look across institutions, on average, the growth is so mediocre? Okay, well, a couple things here. First, quantity matters, <laughs> okay? This is gonna sound silly, but quantity matters. So let me talk about that. Uh, we were doing some work for ACNU in which we were interested in trying to find experiences that promoted growth on what ACNU calls personal and social responsibility outcomes. So what kinds of activities will uh, lead students to develop their sense of, you know, their interest in diversity, their interest in interacting with new ideas, um, their, their sense of political and social activism and engagement, uh, their sense of, of social justice, leadership, and so on. And so we started just going through looking at the students and identifying some basic activities here. And you see the list here, there's seven of them. Um, participating in study abroad, uh, serving as an orientation leader, um, a leadership position of some sort, being an RA, uh, participation leader, participating excuse me, in leadership training, being a peer advisor, or doing community service. Okay? These things add up, or these things influence these these, these personal and social responsibility outcomes, and they do so in a, in a summative way. That is, doing one of them has a little effect. Doing more of them has more effect, and there's no evidence of a ceiling effect here. So here's the question looking at these, these seven things. Over the four years of college, at a, at, a, at a good institution that has a very engaging environment, just ask yourself, how many of these things should a student have done at least once? What proportion of these seven things should students have done at least once over the course of their four years? Okay, just think about that. Okay, so here's what our students said. Okay, if you look, you'll see that that the the, the big the, the tall one is 25 percent is, is the graph here. But essentially, for students, um, a small percentage of them, right? If you look at the left hand side, you've got about 22 percent. Okay, 23% have done none or one. Okay, you've got a very small percentage going from about 8% have done five, 4% uh, have done six, 1% seven. A very small number of people have done more than five of these things. Okay, it turns out people have done two or three. Okay? That's not bad, it's not people aren't doing any things, but in terms of having an impact over the course of someone's four years on these outcomes, it's not enough. Here's another example. So I was talking about this interactional diversity question. Here's the actual set of questions on that scale about interactional diversity, about meaningful conversation. So you can see the top question here is, uh, have you attended debates or lectures or current political, uh, on, a, on a current uh, political social issue during the, the current academic year? How often have you had a serious discussion with student affairs staff whose political, social, or religious opinions were different than your own? How often have you had, a serious, uh, had serious conversations with students who are very different from you in terms of the religious beliefs, political opinions, or personal values? Now, this is a set of questions. A lot of the things come to serious conversations and discussions. This set of questions, when students say that they do these things more often across these questions, they tend to grow more across almost all of our outcomes. Okay? When they do fewer of them, they tend not to. Well, how often do students report doing these things? So let's focus just on one question here. How often have you had discussions regarding intergroup relations with diverse students, i.e., or e.g., excuse me, students differing from you in race, national origin, values, religion, or political views? So how often have you had that? Just think about that for a second, those conversations. Okay. Well, here's the data. Between about 38% say never or rarely after four years. And while 29% say often or very, very often, that's great, there's a substantial number of students who say this is not happening very often. Okay, and I'm not just cherry picking that question. This is another view of the, the questions here. And what you have here is a slide where the, the, the bar on the left is the sort of, this is our measure trying to sum across all the questions we use to get these different, these, these big three. The bar on the left represents sort of the frequency with which students report experiencing the good teaching and and, and high quality interactions with faculty and staff. The bar in the middle is the, the frequency with which students ex report experiencing academic challenge and high expectations. And the bar on the right, that's the one where is, that's how often students report engaging in these serious conversations, meaningful discussions, et cetera. 
And across all of them, the mode is sometimes. That question I showed you is not unusual. So it is, the interactional diversity is the one that has the least, or at least by student reports, is occurring less than the other of our big three. And here's the thing, sort of pulling us all the way back to the, the um, academically adrift. Interactional diversity across four years is the good practice, and at least in our study, that has the biggest influence on critical thinking. Okay? Yet it's the one that seems to be occurring the least. Okay? So there's not a, so there are, you know, clearly there's some good things going on on campuses, people are engaging in good discussions, but the pervasiveness of these things is not as high as we would like, okay? Pervasiveness is not as high as we would like. Oops. Can't have that on the floor, okay, good. That's from me being a Boy Scout, you can't leave flags on the floor, it's not a good thing. Okay, so and that's, that's one piece. So pervasiveness is not high. Here's the second thing, and this, is, this, this, this I think starts to get to why or how, um, that it gets really challenging in terms of implementing, going from the sort of knowing about good practices, reading about good practices and high impact conditions to actually implementing them. And that is that the good practices don't have the same impact on everyone. Okay? The good practices don't have the same impact on everyone. Now I know we know this intuitively, that depending on your background, depending on where you come from, your experiences prior to college, that running into a particular program, okay, study abroad let's say, that your, how you were formed educationally and socially before you go away and study abroad is gonna have an influence on how study abroad influence, it affects you. But this makes it, I think, when you think about it, devilishly hard to design programs. If you, so let's take a look, and here's just some research data. So I've been talking about interactional diversity, and I, here's a table I hope sort of gets at just the tip of the iceberg of what we're seeing when we do research on what, what researchers call conditional effects. That is, the effects of a set of experiences, uh, how are the effects of a set of experiences moderated or changed by what experiences you have or who you are, okay? So for example, um, so those nine questions of interactional diversity, so sets of questions on serious conversations. Uh, the first variable, the first outcome looking at critical thinking. So what's the effect of interactional diversity on critical thinking? Well, on average, for men and for women on average across our study, it's positive. The more of those experiences you have, the more likely you are to grow. That's why it's green. Notice the red thing next to the, the uh, high ACT, SATs thing. It turns out that interactional diversity, although for, on average for men and women, it's beneficial in terms of critical thinking growth. For people with high ACT, SAT scores, high levels of academic preparation, actually it doesn't have a positive effect but it does have a positive effect for people who come in with lower SAT, ACT scores. Okay. Um, let's look at the same set of, 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 again, interactional diversity. What's the effect of interactional diversity on political orientation? Well, here it's a little different, right? For women, at least as far as we can see, say, there's no effect. Doesn't liberalize them or conservatize them or anything, no effect. But for men, it does have a liberalizing effect politically. How about high ACT, SAT? Well, it turns out uh, that for, for high ACT, it has an effect, but, but in terms of political orientation, interactional diversity has a smaller effect for high ACT students than it does for lower ACT students, okay? So, this is just the tip of the iceberg. As you start going through more and more elegantly designed analyses, you can look at the effects of, let's take the effects of ethnicity and ethnic background on, on, on these experiences, and all sorts of other things are playing a role in here, okay? So the point is that, in, you know, when you have a large study, statistically, we can try and disaggregate and disconnect all these things. I can talk about race versus income versus high school experiences versus pre, but the students in our programs come whole, right? <laughs> They gather all those things together. So it's kind of hard when you take a good practice, given that good practices really differentially impact people with different backgrounds, it's hard out of the blocks to imagine how this good practice X or new program Y is gonna influence a particular set of students because of all the things they bring to the table um, that may influence and moderate the effects of that. So this leads to the dilemma. We've seen this with schools with which we've worked. 
infusing research uh, programs with, with research-based good practices or high-impact practices sometimes may not have any impact on the outcomes associated with the program. Sometimes it doesn't because a context matters, right? Who are your students? What are the background qualities they have? How are they connecting with this good practice? How are all the different things that are influencing them connecting with this, this program you're setting up? And B, the second thing, this is really, it gets even harder, is that quality matters as well. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Um, one of the things that, that they found in Academically Adrift, and we have found as well, is that when you look at the impact of cooperative learning, okay, it turns out not to be so good across our study. It doesn't look so good across Academically Adrift. In fact, Academically Adrift claims it's actually a negative influence. Now, this stands in contrast to a long line of research about the benefit of cooperative learning. Uh, what's going on? Well, my sense of what's going on is that there's all sorts of people set up cooperative learning programs, but doing a cooperative learning program well is hard. It takes some real work to get it set up so it's actually benefiting students. You just can't slap those things together. And so I think what we're seeing here, and I actually observe this when I visit institutions, is that you have some programs which are emphasizing cooperative learning that are very carefully designed. They're monitoring how students are interacting. They're monitoring the setting in which they're interacting and how. Okay. And others which are thrown together sounds too, uh, <laughs> but I think there are some people who believe you just get some students together and good things will happen. It turns out, no, that's not quite how it works. And so when you do a national study, you get all kinds of cooperative learning. You get some really good stuff. You get some stuff that's not so good. You average it all together and you get So let me, let me finish up here and then we can go to questions here. So I think with the lesson that we're learning, having worked with the institutions in the Wabash study and outside the Wabash study for many years to try and get a sense of going, and this is not a critique of good practices per se, this is actually trying to go from the good practices we tried to identify in our study to helping them use them, is that research-based good practices, high impact practices of the kind you talk about here, the kind we got in our study, are a great starting point for improving programs. They're a great starting point. But you ultimately have to tune those things to your campus, to your students, to your faculty and staff who are implementing these programs. And the only way to do that over time is through ongoing assessment. And I know everybody loves assessment, but I think it turns out that this is what's necessary to sort of really keep working. You, you, you start with some program, but it's this over, this iterative attempt over the course of time where people look at what's working, what's not working, tune, refine the practices, refine the faculty training, staff training that goes into it, refine other things. That's when you start actually realizing the impact of some of these things. And it's very rare to sort of put together a program, implement the good practices, and shazam, you have something that's effective. And the other thing I would say about the assessment piece, and just to raise the assessment bar a little higher, <laughs> um, is that I think that, that a lot of schools that we have worked with, uh, when they do assessment, they often emphasize assessing an outcome. So we've worked with schools that do the collegiate learning assessment, but then they don't ex uh, assess student experiences. We have other schools that do a lot with student experiences. They'll use NESI or SERP or some other very good measures of student experience, but they actually won't focus on outcomes. And I think the real benefit to doing, or one of the ways to really get some traction out of your assessment is if you're doing both simultaneously. Because you can look at the outcomes to see how two students are changing over time. And then you look at the, um, the measures of experience to get a diagnosis of what you might change in the environment that might help with the outcomes. Connecting them together seems to be very potent. It's hard to do, but that seems to be the most potent because you get it once to change, and then ideas for what you might change to promote change, as it were, how you might change your program to uh, facilitate things. So that's the end of my uh, overall remarks. Uh, you can find out more about the Wabash study. I'll, uh, we'll leave a copy of this somewhere so you can get a uh, copy of this. Uh, you can find out more about the Wabash study at the Center of Inquiry website. Um, the findings are at our, our website as well. Uh, there's some also information on the Teagle Scholar program and the Higher Education Data Sharing Consortium there as well. And thanks for your time and attention. And we can go to questions uh, now if you'd like. And there are microphones for questions apparently set up back there, so if people want to just ask away.
I'll go ahead and start with the question. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> yes, Jennifer. Um, I, I am particularly compelled by the fact that those um, high impact practices and the diversity initiatives have such impact and the, the notion of them having a differential impact for different groups of students. One of the conversations that's come up quite a bit throughout this conference has been the notion of um, different populations of students for whom accessibility to some of those experiences might be difficult. So veterans, non-traditional age students, commuters, um, working students. Can you help under, uh, can you remark on the fact um, or the issue of accessibility of these practices we know work and we know work for certain, pop certain populations and getting those students to be able to have access right. to them when there's issues of resources and time and that kind of an issue? Right. So, 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 uh, hmm. so let, me, let me try and respond and see if it's a, you can tell me it's not a response to your question. One of the things that's been really fascinating to me is I've had conversations with students about the diversity questions especially has been um, how do I say this? that students, and, uh, students are thinking of diversity. I, I wonder if what's maybe happening in some ways is if students are thinking of diversity in different ways and their ways of thinking about diversity are changing more rapidly than people like me, uh, that people admire. And I, that is that faculty and staff, I think, have some ideas about diversity. But if you talk to different student groups about what constitutes diversity, all sorts of interesting stuff comes up. My sense of when talking with students, in terms of what they point as being diverse, not just they talk about religious stuff, political values, all sorts of other things that may be sources of diversity in your community that, that do not fall in the realm of traditional diversity. My sense of talking with students is that what makes the most difference is actually sitting down with someone whose values, ideas, identity is different from your own and engaging in that real conversation, discussion about those things in a way that's exploratory. It doesn't necessarily involve very expensive trips. It doesn't necessarily involve very elaborate programs. Even in the face of elaborate programs, it involves the wise staff or faculty who are able to foment those conversations, those actual let's talk about stuff that's real and meaningful. And so it's, my sense is that, there's, that for every group, I mean, we've been to campuses that are very, very homogeneous, for example, in some way with regard to ethnicity. But there are very powerful discussions uh, sometimes very challenging discussions taking place about religion and religious values and diversity, for example. Uh, we've been to other campuses where there's, there's community colleges where there are very challenging discussions <laughs> going along age lines. And so I think that, that it, part of doing this well is what are, the, what are the sources of diversity in your institution that are there already? What, what's present? If you talk to students about what diversity, what do they identify as being diverse or where people are really different? And then simply what are the situations that get them to talk civilly with each other about issues surrounding that. And it doesn't take huge program dollars, I don't think, in some ways, but it takes some real intentionality about when you get them together to try and get those conversations to happen. That's my sense. Yeah, another, another question. Yeah. Um, have you been able, with the number of students and institutions that you've worked with, been able to tease out any significant differences between different kinds of campuses? As an example, where I'm at at IUPUI, we're very much of an urban campus. We have a lot of transfer students. Wabash, I think, is more of a residential campus. Yes. Uh, how do we deal with these things differently uh, as a result of what you've learned? So, so what I would say, <laughs> so we have been able to tease them out uh, in some cases, and what I would say is that, in fact, every, every campus is, I hate to say it's a research project. <laughs> and what I literally mean is, and I hope this is addressing your question, there are particular campuses where we've been to where we'll take a first cut on the data, and we'll go in and say, and, uh, one example is peer interactions, the quality of positive peer interactions. Nationally, we don't see much positive effect of good social peer interactions on our, our learning outcomes nationally. But there are particular campuses where, in fact, we see a very powerful effect of the quality of peer interactions uh, on learning. Okay? When you get to that campus, you sort of quickly find out what it is about the campus or why that campus is different in some ways and how it, 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 those interactions take place. So the, one example is a, this is a residential campus where students have to form their own um, educational program. They actually have to design their own major and then defend it to a panel of faculty. 
And it turns out this campus, the way housing was well set up, students were literally in the housing constantly engaging in these discussions about their identity, their major, what their major was going to be, trying to puzzle through questions that faculty were going to ask them before they defended their major. And in that setting, and again, it's, it, it, that, and that is a residential campus, the peer interactions were really predictive of changes in critical thinking and all sorts of other stuff, grades and things like that. Other small residential campuses, which you'd think the same thing would be going on naturally, it wasn't happening. Okay? And so what we see over and over again is that there are particular things that are often connected with the campus's um, student body, with the particular peculiarities of their, of their particularities of their curriculum, et cetera, that are in fact having an impact on students, but you really have to sort of drill down to find them and, and, and can, to, to dig them out. That, that, does, that, does that answer your question? Well, kind of and kind of not. Okay, so where did I miss? Um, you know, I look at some of the, the factors you put up there, like, you know, the ability of students to get engaged in other things. Mm -hmm. Easier to do in a residential campus, l more difficult in an urban campus. Right. Um, the true diversity of the students, the fact that in an urban campus, we're in many cases taking transfer students who got courses someplace else, but maybe never connected, and all of a sudden we're picking, up, picking them up midstream. Okay. Um, trying to find what are those differences that we need to do something about gotcha. that will allow us to improve the final outcome. Okay, so I think I got it, <laughs> I'll do better. Which is, so here's the funny thing, that the finding about what was effective, those big three, those three were effective at every kind of institution, from community college, through you know, regional universities, liberal arts colleges. And then B, here's the thing that's funny about them. Even though you think there would be large differences on average across institu between institutional types, let's say, and how often or not often those things were happening, it actually turned out the differences between institutional types is relatively small. And in fact, there are regional campuses, there are other campuses that are doing quite well on any one of these things. There are community colleges that have engaged parts of these things really, really well. Um, and there are residential liberal arts colleges that have not. And so you can actually see this overlap in the data. So what's fascinating is that all the things I would have predicted would have created these big gaps, in fact, don't turn out to be very big differences in the data. And it seems to be more connected with campus culture, the intentional learning community, and those kinds of things. So it's not as, so the stuff works for all students as far as we can tell, it, overall, on average. It's then the mechanisms that different institutions, institutional types have chosen to try and implement and monitor those things. Some of them do a better job of tuning it to their circumstances than others do. Does that, that yeah, that's, that's Thank you the, very much. Thank you, yeah. I think in a way you answered my question, but I'll, I'll ask it sure. anyway. Um, I think for those of us who are in a position to perhaps influence policy, uh, say at a statewide level and with a number of different kinds of institutions, to what extent should we be pushing our systems and individual campuses to define critical thinking uh, and, dare I say, to measure it? Um, I would say that you should be pushing, <laughs> here's where I, I'm going to suggest a push and pull. <laughs> I would say I would push campuses very hard to try and define it in the ways that their faculty and departments are going to define it but I would definitely n not get into the business of using a measure like we used as a statewide measure of critical thinking, okay? So let me take, address the, the final thing. The critical thinking measure we use, the CAP critical thinking test, has been used for statewide assessment going back many years. The frightening thing about it, frankly, is that it is so highly correlated with SAT that it is essentially an IQ measure, okay? Likewise, with the collegiate learning assessment, although it doesn't correlate well at the individual level because it's, there's a lot of noise in CLA data, at the institution level, it correlates like 0.9 something or 0.8, I think there's a FIPSI grant, with the, uh, the CAP critical thinking test that we have. I don't think, oops, I don't think we have, that these measures are not really good measures of critical thinking, I, I think in the way we want to do it, because I think critical thinking is probably going to be embedded in the critical inquiry and practice of disciplines and programs. So a degree tuning approach to it I think it's probably a smarter way to go with student work in the long run than these standardized measures. As much as we've used the standardized measures, um, I really am concerned that we're adopting measures actually that don't show that much change over time. Yeah, and I think avoiding the, the political issues in, in today's environment is, uh, is pretty important, although it's hard to do. Yeah. Thanks. Sure enough, sure. Excellent.
Charles, um, I'm not sure I really uh, know how to ask you this, but I'm just going to try anyway. Uh, your opening um, uh, sharing with uh, some data that I suspect would be a great cause for concern for you, correct? The, the, um, the overall growth patterns? Yes. Yeah. Okay. It was, well, it's not, it wasn't happy news, John. <laughs> right. Okay. Now, in spite of that, uh, could you quickly summarize what signs might you see in your data that might make you more optimistic or more hopeful? Okay. Uh, and how would you connect that to our work in this audience? You, you've thought about who we are and what we do and right. our respective spheres of influence. So. If maybe we could leave this session with a few words from you about what you think the secret sauce is about uh, moving us away from that, uh, you know, pretty uh, pessimistic beginning. Sure. So, so I think that the, the, the good news on most campuses that we have in our study, actually it's fabulous news, is that there's a proportion of students that are changing. Look, I was faculty for 20 years before I started this work. I knew of the students who were transformed by our education, both when I was at, at Wabash and when I was at Eastern Illinois. And you can see them in the data. You can see students who come in and just take off on a whole variety of things, who get incredibly engaged in their campuses. And every campus we visited, regardless of its resources, the kind of institution, et cetera, you find groups of students who are doing phenomenal work. And faculty and staff are doing phenomenal work. That's, that's real. The challenge is we also see other things that average that a little bit. Um, but I think the, the other good news is that you know, what we're finding is stuff, as I said, we know the stuff that works. The challenge is in the implementation. Uh, the challenge is in the implementation of moving from this knowledge of good practices to the extent to which good practices are actually happening in our students' presence. And that's, that's, a, that's more challenging than I imagine. When I started the Wabash study uh, 10 years ago or so, when we began this project, uh, what I imagined, I had a bad theory of action. Because my imagination, my imagination about it was that we would collect really high quality longitudinal data. It would, it would show the good practices that work. We would write these wonderful reports. They would go to campuses and people would go, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And then learning would improve, right? That the report would be the genesis for change. And in fact, I think a lot of the research that's been done nationally is that if we just get the, good, the news out, the good practices out there, they'll change. Uh, that turns out to be very hard work. The people who are at this meeting, the folks who are coming from institutions at this meeting, you have it within your power, this great research, great resources on stuff that has worked on average across institutions. Great starting points. You're not starting in the dark. Um, I think that the task ahead for us, and it's a doable task, we have the tools today, is the ongoing tuning and work within our institutions to sort of take these good starts and then really optimize them and refine them at our institutions so that the faculty and staff who are engaging in, the students who are in them, they're really extracting the value from them, the potential that's there for them. So that would be my overall summary, John. Yeah, I'm oh, sorry, yes. You had a, a slide earlier that said uh, some items that predicted growth, including like orientation leaders being an RA. Yes, yeah, yeah. A lot of that slide had to do with added to class interactions and a lot of self-selected interactions from yes. students. Uh, can you speak more about that and, and about that high, the idea of self-selection and yeah. does that indicate more growth then of that student? Right. So uh, there is absolutely a high degree of self-selection. These For our analyses, what we did was when we look at the effect of these, we always started with the pretest measure on something when they came to college. So the question was, did these move them any farther, controlling for where they started, did these have an effect? So we're trying to take into account the selection bias, as it were, into we're not just looking at the post-test outcomes. But yeah, these are hugely, in fact, and what's interesting about these things is that you'll see differential um, participation, um, students of, of different genders, of different uh, ethnic backgrounds will, will differentially participate in these things. But what we, what's interesting about it is we don't see, when I look at this thing, I don't see a differential effect of some of these things by those qualities. And so I think what it points out to me at least is that creating programs that then students access solely by choice creates some problems because a lot of students who won't benefit from it don't get into them, okay? So I, I completely agree on the self-selection bias. I think analytically we've taken care of it, but I don't think we take care of self-selection bias in the way our programs are often implemented. It's certainly ones at Wabash uh, are implemented. Absolutely, it's a great question. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering if the 
kind of extended experience students are having in college. Now it's not a four-year education. Right. It's, we're lucky to get a six-year education, yep. uh, both in community colleges and at four institutions. If that might have some impact on the growth pattern, the developmental thinking patterns and so forth of those students that you're measuring, is there any comparison to older data that was more in the traditional method and to see how that might um, play out? No, I don't know. It's a great question. I mean, I'm actually going to try. Uh, you know, I, when I first started this study, I kept calling fourth year students seniors, which is clearly wrong, uh, and it's not. And we're actually going to try and track students beyond this point educationally. So uh, that's, that's, that's absolutely right. I agree. And I think that part of if what I'm seeing so far is true is that on a bunch of different measures, it's the quantity of these interactions that take place. And so if you're actually taking six years to have the educational experience, it may take longer for those things to accrue. So it's, it's a really good point. Yeah, excellent point. Other questions? Did everybody finish up? Well, thank you very much.